final talk. Uh, it'll be uh, it'll be by Dr. Todd Sachter. Uh, Todd, of course, is one of our own from downstate. Uh, he's really uh, done extraordinary uh, uh, research uh, in in every way. His primary appointment is in physiology and uh, 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 and. Uh, uh, and uh, he got a secondary appointment in neurology, and uh, uh, he is a full-fledged uh, neurologist. We're all proud, our neurologists are proud to say here uh, anyway. Uh, and uh, he's really done extraordinary uh, research uh, uh, in, every, uh, uh, in every way. He's been steadily funded with several grants continuously over uh, the last 20, 25 years, uh, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, he's really been he's really been the leader, I think, in in in, in areas of uh, of the research that uh, he's doing, uh, and uh, so it's a great pleasure for me and for all of us uh, here at Downstate, and a great honor for all of us here at Downstate uh, to introduce him. So. So thank you very much, Roger. So my father was a uh, lab chief at the uh, NIH, intramural, similar, I guess, to, to Dr. Hallett. <clears throat> and um, so he was a lab chief uh, during the time that Nixon came in. And he saw that when Nixon, President Nixon came in, <clears throat> that the NIH funding will never be the same. In the 60s, it was like 50th percentile. And he knew that he could see the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall that it's just going to go down and down and down <clears throat> from then on. It would never be like it was. And so I was a postdoc in uh, Jimmy Schwartz's lab at Columbia studying um, learning and memory and aplesia. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I was, you know, it was a couple of years uh, in advance to being an assistant professor. But my father said to me, he said, listen, there's two things you need to be happy as an assistant professor, and only two things. You need hard money and a chairman who likes you. So now, my father had died before I uh, was time to make a decision about where to go as an assistant professor, but I had already met Bob Wong, who was at Columbia then. And Bob was becoming chair of uh, pharmacology here at Downstate. And so he said, well, why don't, you, why don't you think about it? Come on over to come down to Downstate and take a look around. Well, I mean, I knew Downstate had those two things that could make me happy. It had hard money, and I really liked Bob. <clears throat> but back then, while the escalators were working, they <laughs> hadn't been cleaned in, you really couldn't say how many years. <clears throat> and there were just great open spaces, just, just rooms filled with like em either empty or filled with, you know, just, uh, <clears throat> it was really quite a state. I was shocked first time I saw it. <clears throat> but I, I remembered my father's words. And then I, you know, went around, and I was a neurologist, and I went around and, and met Roger, and then we spoke for around an hour. And then after that, after that <clears throat> meeting, it was, it was clear I was coming to Downstate because I would have two chairmen who might like me. So <clears throat> there was no question about coming to Downstate. The question was what to do when I was here. <clears throat> and so what I was interested in from my work in Jimmy Schwartz and Eric Kandel's group was memory. And from that work at that time in the early 90s, it was already known that memory goes through various temporal phases. There's an initial acquisition and then a consolidation period. We're talking a cellular consolidation period for around an hour or so. And then that information that's acquired in short-term memory becomes consolidated into a long-term memory store that can last for many hours, days, weeks, even, of course, for humans, for decades. 
And from the work of Kandel and Schwartz and many, many others from model systems, we knew, back, even back in the late 80s, early 90s, and a fair amount about the molecular mechanisms of this consolidation period that, as I said, lasts around an hour after you learn something. But was, what was undiscovered territory was, well, what does that information become consolidated into? What is the actual storage, the physical storage of information that's in the brain? That's your long-term memory store. That seemed like just the big question. And so I figured, well, that's what I'll try to focus on. And now the reason I met Bob Wong is because it was clear from the work in Aplesia from Kandel and Schwartz that there were probably a few different possible molecular mechanisms for how long-term memory worked. I didn't think there was going to be a thousand, and I didn't think there was going to be one. There might be a few. So how do you know which is the one that was going to be most relevant for mammalian systems and people? And so at that time in the early 90s, basically, in a sense, Aplesia was successful. It had shown and convinced most neuroscientists that the changes in synaptic transmission, particularly a strengthening of synaptic connections between neurons within a network, was the likely physical substrate for a long-term memory trace. And therefore, we could then look and just make that assumption and then look directly at those synaptic connections and how they might become stronger and try to understand the underlying molecular mechanisms that keep those synapses stronger. So it was Bob Wong, who was at that time the only person at Columbia doing hippocampal slice. And so I went over to Bob and I said, well, could you teach me LTP? And, uh, <clears throat> And he said, well, OK, well, but I'm going to downstate. All right, fine, I'll go with you. <clears throat> so basically, the synapse that I'm uh, going to be talking about today is, between, is in the hippocampus. This is a hippocampal slice from a rat. And a part of, of the, the hippocampus called the CA3 region, the pyramidal cells send out axons that then synapse onto the dendrites of pyramidal cells in CA1. And we're going to use that simply as a model system, as hundreds and hundreds of labs around the world do. And then this is the phenomenon that back in the, in the 90s was, <clears throat> again, hundreds and hundreds of labs all around the world were focusing on trying to figure out. It's called long-term potentiation, LTP. So here's what LTP is. So if you're, this is from the very first paper on LTP from Tim Bliss and Terj Lomo. And uh, basically, if you give a, a little electric shock and stimulate those axons and then record postsynaptically, if you give that little electric shock at a relatively low test stimulation rate, say once every 15 seconds, well, then the response to that little single electric shock that you give is very stable. But if now in one second, where that arrow is, you give a hundred of those little electric shocks, and then after that second go back to the every 15 second test stimulation rate, something happened during that one second to cause an increase in the strength of the synaptic connection. And that increase is persistent, going on for hours and hours and hours. In fact, later it was shown in vivo, it was going on for weeks to months. And so as I said, <clears throat> this seemed to be such an attractive possible mechanism for how long-term memory might be figured out, we had hundreds of labs trying to figure this out. Particularly in my focus on what is the machinery that keeps LTP going. But by the end of the 90s, when you had all these groups working on LTP, 
it became clear to most people that this was not going to be figured out very quickly. In fact, it would seem just as complicated as trying to figure out long-term memory in behaving animals. And that's because by the end of the 90s, there were already over 100 signaling molecules that had been implicated in LTP. And like long-term memory, there seemed to be a transition between an early, short-term form of LTP and a long-term, persistent form. And as Kandel and Schwartz and others had shown in model systems, that transition from the short to the long required new gene expression, the synthesis of new proteins. Well, when people looked at well, what the genes that were changing, over 14% of the genome changed during LTP. So by the mid-2000s, pretty much all laboratories had kind of just sort of given up on the idea of finding an underlying, sim simple, understandable molecular mechanism for how LTP could be persistent. But the thing is, what most people didn't appreciate is while there are over 100 signaling molecules that are implicated in LTP, in a sense, they're all implicated in the same way. They're all doing induction of LTP, but they're not, in a strict sense, involved in the maintenance of LTP. <clears throat> well, what do I mean by that? Well, as I said, I, I was working on a in the plesia, I was working on a form of a protein kinase called protein kinase C. And Kandel and Schwartz had shown, and Kandel won the Nobel Prize, for showing that the one particular protein kinase, the cyclic A and P dependent kinase, was important for short term memory. So it was Jimmy, my mentor, who had the hypothesis that, well, maybe long term memory could be a transformation of that kinase into a persistently active form. And that was actually a popular idea back in, in the late 80s and early 90s. But here is an experiment that illustrates the difference between induction and maintenance that threw a wet blanket on that concept. So here's LTP in a slice. <coughs> Test stimulation, very stable. Now, if you add to the bath of the slice a drug called storosporin. So storosporin is a very general protein kinase inhibitor. In a typical mammalian genome, there are 500 or so kinases, and storosporin inhibits around 80% of them. And it inhibits, as I mentioned, PKA, the cyclic AMP-dependent kinase, and CAMK2, and tyrosine kinases, and most forms of PKC. So if you shut down hundreds of kinases all at once, and then that give that tetanus, that 100 hertz stimulation in one second, you actually still get some potentiation, but then it goes away. So at least some kinases are important for LTP. But the key experiment was this. If you simply wait an hour and then add storosporin to the bath, it does absolutely nothing to the maintenance of LTP. So this experiment that was done around the, <clears throat> in the 90s, basically, as I said, made most people think that, the, that Jimmy's notion of a persistently active kinase being important for long-term potentiation, for maintaining that strengthening, that most people just said, yeah, that, forget that. We got to look, it's just, it's, too simple a hypothesis. <clears throat> but I was interested in a particular group of kinases called protein kinase C. And I was interested because it had the simplest mechanism for becoming a constitutively active and therefore persistently active kinase. So schematically, here's protein kinase C. It's a single polypeptide, and it has a catalytic domain, I show it in green, a hinge, and a regulatory domain in red. And the regulatory domain contains a pseudo-substrate sequence that binds to and inhibits the catalytic domain, keeping it in its basal state 
always turned off. Then second messengers, such as diacylglycerol or for some isoforms of PKC calcium, when they increase inside the cell, they bind to the regulatory domain, causing a conformational change that allows access to substrates that then can get phosphorylated. And that's the action of kinase, is to phosphorylate protein substrates. But like most protein kinases, this transition from an inactive to an active state is a reversible reaction. And that makes a lot of sense for cellular signal transduction. It's like the keys on the keyboard of your laptop. They all have little springs underneath them, keeping them in the off position. You have to have that in order to use the keys over and over and over again. So most protein kinases are, are, not, are signal transduction devices. They're not signal or information storage devices, like the hard disk in your computer. <clears throat> but PKC had a very simple mechanism for becoming an information storage device. And that's because when PKC was in its open conformation, it was now accessible to limited proteolysis that would separate the regulatory domain from the catalytic domain. And that free independent catalytic domain can now just continuously phosphorylate. The problem was is that this was always a test tube phenomenon. No one had ever seen a PKN form in a cell. And so that was my first decision when I came here to Downstate, to look and see if there are any PKMs in the hippocampus. And by that time, it was already known that PKC was not a single, from a single gene, but it was actually a small gene family of uh, nine different genes. And so what I did is I made antibodies to all forms, all nine, and I made them in their C terminus, where the catalytic domain is so that on a Western blot, where you can visualize the size of proteins on a gel, I could see the expression of a full-length form of PKC, and if it existed, the shorter fragment, the PKM. And what we found was that virtually every PKC is present in the hippocampus. But there was only one form, the zeta isoform, that had that shorter fragment, that PKM form. And when I <clears throat> looked to see what happens during LTP by basically tetanizing a slice and waiting and then grinding up and looking at all the PKCs and comparing that to control slices from the same hippocampus, what we found was there was only one form of PKC that seemed to have a persistent effect, and that was an increase in this PKM zeta that went on and on for hours that correlated with the amount of potentiation. So I thought, well, we're on the right track. But there was something already not making any sense, even from this very first experiment. Because while we were seeing PKM zeta go up, we were not seeing what we thought was its precursor, PKC zeta, go down. In other words, if PKC zeta is getting cleaved, if PKM zeta is going up, the PKC zeta was going down, should be going down. But we weren't seeing that. So we figured, oh, well, there must be new protein synthesis that's replacing the precursor, PKC zeta. <clears throat> and so what we did is, as others had shown before, we added a niacinamide, a protein synthesis inhibitor, to the bath. And as others had found, that blocked that late phase of LTP, but preserved the early. But to our surprise, it also blocked the increase in PKM zeta. <laughs> now it was Ivan Hernandez, <clears throat> who was a student in my lab and now has his own lab in pathology here at Downstate, who figured this out. And the essence of what Yvonne found was that in the zeta gene, and only the zeta gene of the nine PKCs, 
there was, in addition to a promoter that makes the full length form with the regulatory domain and the catalytic domain, the zeta gene had an internal promoter, which produces a messenger RNA, which worked in collaboration with Henry Tija here at Downstate and Ilhelm Musumov found was transported to dendrites. And then what Yvonne showed in addition was that normally in the basal state of neurons, this messenger RNA dedicated to the synthesis of PKM zeta was almost never expressed. That's why people had missed it in the past, part of the reason. And what we found was is that only during that strong tetanization, that, that burst of stimulation that induces LTP, opens up the NMDA receptor, allows calcium to come into the postsynaptic spine, and all of these signaling molecules are important for releasing that translational block. So in the first 10 years of coming to downstate, we really had a great mechanism Okay, it looked like a very, very attractive for making an uh, information storage molecule that might have something to do with the persistence of LTP. But LTP is a physiological persistence of enhanced synaptic strength. So the next question was, well, what is this actually doing? And for that, we have to, I had to turn, I couldn't do that myself in my own lab. And so one of the things that Roger and Bob did together was to bring together a critical mass of neuroscientists working on the hippocampus. And it was Larry Bernardo who made the most, was the person to whom it made the most sense to collaborate with. Because he, with Doug Ling, could do the following critical experiment. What we did is we recombinantly expressed as biochemists and purified PKM zeta. And then we gave to Doug and Larry. And what they did is they put in extremely low concentrations into a whole cell recording pipette and patched on to a CA1 pyramidal cell in a hippocampal slice. And they're giving only now to record synaptic transmission only that test stimulation, not the tetanus. But you don't need the tetanus because as PKM zeta comes out of the pipette, dialyzing into the cell, it causes a huge increase in synaptic transmission. On average, a doubling of synaptic transmission. And at one to th three nanomoles, this is by far the most potent potentiating substance known. So PKM zeta by itself was sufficient within a synapse to cause synaptic potentiation. But was it necessary for maintaining synaptic potentiation? Well, here's that experiment that I started with, the storosporin. Blocks induction, but not maintenance. But the devil's in the details, because I said, well, yeah, it inhibits 80% of kinases, but PKM zeta is one of those that are not inhibited. But there are two known agents that do inhibit PKM zeta potently. One is a, a plant toxin called shellerethrin. And so what we did is we tetanized, waited an hour, and then added to the bath shellerethrin. We had a second pathway with with a second stimulating electrode independent from the first and use that as a control. And what we found when shellerethrin, this PKM zeta inhibitor, gets into the bath, that a reversed LTP, which was something that thousands of labs around the world had never seen before, that you can actually reverse LTP an hour after it had been induced. So we wanted something a bit more rationally designed than this ring-like uh, shellerethrin compound. So what we did <coughs> is use the peptide sequence from that pseudo-substrate, 13 amino acids, meristylated them so that it could now penetrate into the cell. And we called that zeta inhibitory peptide, or ZIP. And ZIP was a very potent inhibitor of PKM zeta. And ZIP did what shellerethrin did, but nothing in the world had ever previously been shown to do.
which is to reverse LTP one hour after it had been induced. In fact, the IC50 of ZIP put into the bath for its ability to block the potentiation of injected PKM zeta, that IC50 was virtually identical to the IC50 for the reversal of LTP, even if we wait five hours before adding to the bath this zip. <clears throat> so we can wait a long time and still reverse LTP. No one else could do that. And so that meant we had in our hands a tool, this, this zip compound, that could then ask the question, test the hypothesis, that the persistence of LTP has anything at all to do with the maintenance of long-term memory. <clears throat> and so we established what is the dose that's required to reverse LTP in vivo, because it Talking about memory, we're now talking about looking at the hippocampus and injecting zip in the hippocampus of awake behaving animals. So we determined the dose that would reverse LTP even 22 hours after we had induced, uh, after LTP was induced. And again, like in the slices, it had no effect on basal synaptic transmission. So we knew the right dose. But then the next question, was, well, what's the right task? Now, I'm a, I'm a neurologist. I know something about behavioral neurology, but I knew, I knew that I knew nothing about animal behavior. And I also knew from being on study sections that amongst these animal behavior people, they eat their young, if you know what that means. So basically, yeah, I really had to go to an expert. And so... <clears throat> Uh, fortunately, that critical mass of people working on the hippocampus was here at downstairs, as I mentioned. And uh, Andre Fenton was right downstairs. <clears throat> and so Andre, I went downstairs and said, Andre, what's, what's the right task that, that we should do? Should we do uh, the, the water maze? And he said, no, 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 don't do the water maze. There's, there's problems with that. It, it's, there's issues with when it's hippocampus dependent. I said, all right, all right. How about contextual fear conditioning? Eh, all the molecular biologists use that. And he said, no, 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 don't, don't use that. It's like the hippocampus is all about spatial information. And the context is like, who knows what context is? So I said, all right, so Andre, so what's the right task to do? And he said, oh, well, the right task to do is the task that I invented, <coughs> which is called active place avoidance. Well, it turns out he was correct. That was the right task to do in our initial baby steps into behavior. And that's because active place avoidance is very rapidly learned, and it's very hippocampus dependent, and it has short-term and long-term and even very long-term form for a month, always hippocampus dependent. So here's the task. <coughs> So if you put a rat or a mouse into the, a rotating arena, it's around a meter in diameter for a rat, and you put the animal in, and it's like a carousel, slowly rotating once a minute. But there is a non-rotating pizza wedge-shaped sector in which the animal gets a very, very mild electric shock, just enough for it to feel and to want to move away. And so the only way that the animal could learn and then remember to avoid that shock zone is to look not on the floor. Because the carousel is rotating, that information is useless. It has, the rat has to look outside in the rooms at cues. And that makes this task very hippocampus dependent. So looking now down with the camera, this is what we see. So if you put a rat in the apparatus for the first time, it tends to stay on the outside, maybe looking through the clear plastic walls. And this gray zone here, that's where the shock will be. So if you put the rat in and then turn the shock on for 10 minutes, and then take the animal out for 10 minutes, put it in its home cage and repeat that eight times in a row. 
So by two and a half hours, the animal has learned to avoid the shock. Again, I'm just painting in the video that it's red. The information that's on the floor is useless. The animal has to look at cues in the whole room to avoid. So the experiment is this. We take the animal <coughs> and train it just rapidly, just like an LTP, wait 22 hours, and inject saline into both hippocampi as a control, and put the animal two hours back into the apparatus. The shock is off. Now the memory's not perfect, but the animal clearly remembers to avoid that shock zone. Then we take other animals, train them, wait 22 hours, and inject ZIP, that inhibitor of PKM Zeta. And two hours later, put the animal back in. No evidence for the retention of spatial information. <clears throat> so we can measure that avoidance behavior by measuring the time between putting the animal into the apparatus and the time that it goes into the shock zone so for the first time. So here an animal that's naive goes in right away. But over time, those eight training trials, they avoid longer and longer. You wait 20, 22 hours, inject the saline, two hours later put it back, they still remember. Put in zip, animals have forgotten. Short-term memory, which also requires an intact hippocampus for this task, is totally unaffected by the zip. It's very specific to long-term information that's being stored in the brain, not for short-term information. Well, this result <coughs> was a big shock to people because never had anyone been able to, what looks like, erase a memory. Because the zip, that, the half-life of that peptide, is two hours in the brain. But once it's, in, once it's washed out, the memory never comes back. You can wait a week later. And then you can train the animal all over again, and its memory is perfectly fine. So it seemed as if the zip was literally erasing the contents of a hard disk, but not actually damaging the hard disk. And we said it's very easy. All you do is you just you know, call up CalBioChem and order this drug and, um, and try it. <clears throat> so lots of labs tried it. And it worked for most, not all forms of memory, but most forms of memory. That contextual conditioning, if you inject it in the amygdala, it works. If you inject, uh, if you inject it, you'll erase uh, <coughs> uh, actually motor skilled motor learning in rats, even aplesia, the long-term sensitization that uh, Kandel and Schwartz had worked on. All these, but not quite all, but most forms of long-term memory, no matter where, and it doesn't have to be hippocampus dependent, doesn't have to be even vertebrates, can be erased. <clears throat> in collaboration with another group, we found that memories can actually be enhanced even old memories that were nearly gone. And this was first shown by collaboration with a group in the Weizmann Institute who study taste aversion. So this is a very uh, common, <coughs> very powerful type of memory in which an animal is given a novel taste and then within an hour or two injected with a substance that makes it uh, sick, such as lithium, intraperitoneal, and then Weeks later, even months later, the animal, given a choice, will avoid the water that has that novel taste, such as saccharin. And so uh, what we did was use a virus to uh, overexpress either a dominant negative, that's an inactive inhibitory form of PKM zeta, or the normal PKM zeta into the brain, into the insular cortex which is where this uh, information is stored. <clears throat> and just briefly, uh, the, if you inject the dominant negative, even after the memory has been formed, it will do what ZIP did, which is to erase the memory. 
But the key experiment for enhancement is this. If you do the training and then wait a week and then inject and then wait another week for the PKM data to be expressed, a weak memory becomes increased, enhanced. So just as no one had ever seen the erasure of an already stored memory, no one had ever seen the enhancement of, uh, <coughs> of an old memory. So <coughs> this was starting to attract some attention. <coughs> but there were clouds on the horizon. Okay, because <clears throat> all the work that I had just described to you, the ZIP and also that other PKMZ inhibitor, Shalorethrin, that dominant negative, were involving in, thi in blocking this reaction here, PKMZ's action at the synapse. But what about what's going on here at the gene? <clears throat> Suppose you knock out PKMZ. What happens then? And for many people, this is the most powerful experiment because it's very, there could be, maybe there's non-specific effects here, but this is, you know, clearly working on zeta. And so around two years ago, a little more, there were two papers that were published in Nature independently showing that knockouts of PKM zeta had completely normal looking LTP and completely normal looking memory. So I can tell you that within a week of these publications came out that in the, in, and I'm not being over dramatic, in the entire Western world, there were maybe a hundred labs working on PKMZ at that point. In the entire Western world, it all stopped. Okay. And the, or went to a trickle. And, the thing was <clears throat> that uh, this was very disturbing. I, you know, I was like despondent because, yeah, you know, we had a lot of evidence, both from enhancing memory and inhibiting three different ways. That was PKM Zeta that was really important. So I was like, you know, <clears throat> head down, walking the hallways, depressed. And so I, <clears throat> I run into Roger. And Rogers, and I say, yeah, I tell him what's going on. These papers in Nature came out saying we're wrong. But I know that they're wrong. <clears throat> but what can I do? And Rogers just beamed, like smiling. It just means, Todd, it just means that you found something important. And they're after you because they can't, there's nothing else they could do. <clears throat> so that meant that I had to, I changed my attitude. And I realized I can't be despondent. I had to be like the happy warrior, okay. But still, I had to know what to do. <clears throat> and it took a couple of, couple of, almost a year to figure out, well, you know, I had all this evidence, but I needed something that really just directly addressed these knockouts. That's what people wanted. And I had to give them what they want. So how could you prove that a knockout is compensated, that some other gene is taking over. Well, you can do a pharmacogenetic experiment. And so <clears throat> basically, it, here's the hypothesis. <clears throat> the hypothesis is that in the normal wild type LTP, where PKM zeta is being made, and there's this messenger RNA that's normally repressed, but then during that tetanus, it becomes unrepressed, allowing protein synthesis of PKM zeta. Well, if you could specifically block that, in a, that synthesis of PKM zeta by using an antisense oligodeoxynucleotide, <clears throat> then you should block LTP in a wild type animal. But a lot of people don't like antisense because they think it's, well, it can have nonspecific effects. But the thing is, in the knockout animal, the target for the PKM zeta is gone. So if the, if the antisense has no effect on the knockout LTP, well, there's just simply no logical way to escape the hypothesis that there is compensation in the knockout. 
And that's exactly what we saw. <clears throat> so that if you do add the drug, the antisense, it blocks LTP in the wild type, shown here in these black balls. But that same antisense has no effect in the null animal, as shown in the open balls there. So it was very clear from this experiment that there had to be compensation. There had to be some other gene. But as I was giving lectures to people and you know, different institutions, you know, everyone asked the same question. Well, what's compensating? You know, what's, what's doing it? You know, cognitively, everyone had to know. Well, there was the, the, to figure out what that was, we have to look at the evolutionary history of PKM zeta. And so PKM zeta is one of two atypical PKCs. That's the class. And the atypical PKC split off from the other PKCs one billion years ago in single cell eukaryotes. And then there was a single atypical PKC for around 500 million years. And then in the Cambrian period, during the Cambrian explosion, when you had all these different phyla getting made, there was a gene duplication. And from a single atypical PKC, there were two. And from the extant record of, of animals whose genomes we can sequence now, who are still around, we know that PKM zeta was made just right at that moment in evolutionary time when this gene duplication took, took place. But the other gene, the other one, was still always around in vertebrates. It's called iota lambda. And so that was the most likely one. And so what we did <coughs> was look to see in LTP what happens to PKM zeta and iota lambda. So here's that experiment that I started with way, way back in the 90s, maybe the first experiment I showed you. And we reproduced it you know, in mouse decades later. If you look three hours after LTP, PKM zeta is up. Now iota lambda, that's up transiently in the normal wild type LTP at 30 minutes after the tetanus, but by three hours it's back down, shown here with two different antibodies in the blue. But in the knockout, of course, there's no PKM zeta. But instead, iota lambda, the most closely related gene product, becomes persistent. So I go around, I give lectures, and I <coughs> tell people about that. And, and it's like, oh, that's really great. That's really great. But there was one nagging thing. Well, how do you really know that that's actually doing anything? OK, you've got a biochemical compensation. But we care about function. So fortunately, there's an iota lambda specific inhibitor that blocks iota lambda and not zeta. And so we did the experiment in which we added to the bath, again, that classic experiment like we did earlier, but now add an iota lambda inhibitor. And that reversed LTP, but only in the knockout, not in the wild type. And yet, while the drug's around, even though it seems to have absolutely no effect, in a second pathway, if you try to get LTP, you can't. So it's an iota lambda in the wild type is important for induction, not maintenance. In the knockout, it becomes a maintenance molecule. The same thing is true for behavior. I'll just say very briefly <coughs> that basically the antisense to block the synthesis of, uh, of PKM zeta it only works in the knockout, not in the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, only the answer only works in the wild type, not in the knockout. So is there <clears throat> any difference between the knockout and the wild type? I mean, as, <clears throat> here's the thing, I mean, the, there's, these were separate genes for 500 million years. And PKM zeta is always around. It's only expressed in the brain. So there's probably some evolutionary reason for why there's always a PKM zeta. And iota lambda never takes over this maintenance function, which we showed it could. So there has to be something better about PKM zeta. And so what we did is we went back to the active place avoidance 
<clears throat> and just did it slower. That is to say, with just giving it less training. If you give it less training, it takes many days for the memory to accrue. And then that revealed a clear difference between the wild type, which learned perfectly, and the knockout, which learned only half as well. And we did a, another type of behavior, just in time, <clears throat> in which we made where we put toys in, uh, in uh, blocks in, in uh, different uh, contexts more and more difficult. And so, for example, if you put two blocks and train an animal in a context and then move one of them, pretty simple kind of task, both the wild type and the PKM Zeta knockout do very well. If you take four blocks and train the, make the animal very familiar with this environment and put two totally new blocks in there, the animals, the knockouts also get that. But if you put in four blocks and simply rearrange where they are, which is a diff particularly difficult task, the knockouts just simply have no memory for that at all. So the more complicated the task, this compensatory mechanism breaks down. And, and as far as the animals are going, they're probably eaten, you know, in terms of evolutionary thinking. So uh, as I said, <clears throat> in the all, you know, most research on PKM Zeta went to a trickle. But as I said, that was the Western world. And there's an Eastern world. And a couple of months ago, I got an email from a group in uh, Nanjing who used a totally independent technique called uh, SHRNA to knock down PKM Zeta. And they, they informed me that, that we're right, basically. PKM Zeta blocks the late phase of LTP and also can erase memory. So it's not, <clears throat> so basically, it all seems to fit. And so lastly, I'm going to finish up <clears throat> with if we could erase memories and enhance memories, can we actually trace a memory for a long period of time in the brain? Because as I said, you can wait even a month and add the drug zip, and the memory will be erased in the hippocampus. So can you see the PKM zeta? <clears throat> so here we use the knockout mouse to show that antibodies to PKM zeta are very specific. And so here's a control, and here's a trained animal. And this is a day after training, and we look here at the hippocampus. And even a day after the training, you can see increases in PKM zeta here in the hippocampus and CA1 region, overlying cortex, not so much in the thalamus. In fact, even a month later, it's that same pattern. Even a month later, you see an increase in PKM zeta in the hippocampus. So now you may be thinking, well, <clears throat> how is that possible? I mean, this is just a single memory. I mean, wouldn't your brain, we have <clears throat> millions, hundreds of millions of memories, wouldn't our brain just explode with PKM Zeta? Well, my brain explodes with PKM Zeta, but other people's not. And that's because <clears throat> PKM Zeta is actually not in every synapse. In fact, in a, in a naive rat, when we count the number of spines that contain PKM zeta, it's only one out of 200. And so <clears throat> we think that the, the distribution of PKM zeta and therefore potentiated synapses in the hippocampus is very sparse. And then in addition to increases in PKM zeta that I focused my whole lecture on, Sabina Harabatova, uh, who's in the lab, who's now in cell biology, she's shown that if you do long-term depression, the reverse of LTP, you actually degrade persistently the amount of PKM zeta. So we think that under basal conditions of memory storage, there's like a low sparse encoding of PKM zeta at specific spines. And that's what gives the specificity for memory. And uh, <coughs> Second to last slide, I'll mention that many other groups uh, had started working on PKM Zeta in central neuropathic pain, in addictions, 
in post-traumatic stress, and with uh, Sue Mira and Charles Shaw and John Creary, <coughs> who's now at Sinai, we were uh, also showing that uh, PKM Zeta becomes uh, aggregated in inclusion bodies in uh, CA1 primal cells of Alzheimer's disease patients. And so <coughs> let me conclude by saying that PKM Zeta is a persistently active isoform of atypical PKC synthesized during LTP and learning. The persistent activity of atypical PKC maintains late LTP. And it also maintains many forms of long-term memory, including spatial memory in the hippocampus, fear-motivated memory in amygdala, I didn't have time to show you that, reward-motivated memories in nucleus accumbens, habit memories in striatum, elementary associative and skilled motor memories in neocortex. And the persistent action of the other atypical, iota lambda, acts as a backup maintenance mechanism in the PKM zeta knockout. And so one conclusion of this lecture is that PKM zeta is a leading candidate for a component of the molecular mechanism of long-term memory storage. And the other conclusion of this lecture is now I know what it's like, <coughs> what, it, what the qualities are of an ideal chair. So the ideal chair sets you up and lets you do what gives you the freedom to what you want to do. <clears throat> and then the ideal chair, secondly, forms a nucleus, a critical mass of scientists with similar, and similar interests so that when you run into problems or need help and want to evolve, you have those people next to you. And then third, and for me, in a sense, just as important, when times are tough, they've got your back. So thank you, Roger. Very interesting uh, talk and clearly important, but I'm still a uh, little puzzled by why if you, why don't you block all memories when you are blocking, uh, blocking this particular molecule? It would seem if it is responsible for maintaining all of LTP, it shouldn't just block that one memory that you've studied, but should block everything that has been learned. That's uh, correct. It does. Presumably. I mean, we don't test everything, but it, it erases multiple memories. That's absolutely right. And uh, so, the, okay, so the second question then is, does there come a time when it's no longer necessary? Uh, if you go back to actually, I think, the first slide that Paolo showed, uh, the sort of sense with it we have about memories is that for a while it is maintained uh, in, a, in a sense molecularly with molecules like this, but eventually there will be uh, anatomical changes, uh, synaptic sprouting, new, new synapses and things of that sort, which would change a long-term potentiation type effect into an anatomical effect. Might that happen sometime down the road? How long have you checked it beyond one month? I mean, one month is a very long time, but uh, if, well, you, if you take a memory that's been in place for two years, five years, uh, would you be able to block it or would that, all, would that have then converted into an anatomical change? Okay, so uh, for rodents, the longest that's, uh, um, the oldest memory that's been erased that's been looked at is three months. And, no, and that's a neocortical memory, that conditioned taste aversion. And as I said, the oldest in the hippocampus is one month and no one's looked longer than that. But to get to the, the, the issue of will it ever be transformed from a molecular into a, uh, <clears throat> into a purely structural, well, let me point this out. So, in, um, to, to, as I mentioned, a plesia, where this question can actually be studied because you can see the structural changes. What they've, and as I mentioned, these inhibitors of PKM zeta, they erase long-term sensitization in aplesia. Uh, 
And what they're seeing is that the, when you erase the, a long-term memory in aplesia, the anatomical changes go away. It gets more detailed. There's always a, uh, even though it looks static, the anatomical changes, they're actually quite dynamic. So it's what PKM Zeta seems to be doing is maintaining the increased population of synaptic connections, even though those synaptic connections have some turnover. So it's all, we have to rethink of, of our assumptions of what is the maintenance. Let me <coughs> add something else. PKM Zeta itself, as shown by uh, that last group from China, if you inject a shRNA over that month, the PKM zeta levels go down. Well, that means that there's turnover of PKM zeta, at least on, in the hippocampus. And so the question then becomes, well, maybe PKM zeta is really not the maintenance, and maybe there's something else. Maybe those epigenetic changes that are PKM zeta interacting in the nucleus and then having uh, changing the cell, as, as uh, Ivan Hernandez has recently shown. Um, so it could be more complex. But I think the point is, is that we have the, the first opening into what the maintenance mechanism of long-term memory is. 